Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Melissa Barona. I'm Maggie Geraldo. Seth Marini. And we're from the College of Engineering. We're environmental engineering majors from the University of Miami. And we are Team Energia. We're here to present our project on biohydrogen as an alternative sor energy source for Cuba. So I buy a so why biohydrogen? Um, with the combustion of fossil fuels, there are a lot of greenhouse gases emitted into the atmosphere, and that has a lot of environmental implications, and also it affects human health. Hydrogen, it's, an air, it's a very clean. The only byproduct from its combustion is water. It can be stored, and it can be used directly as a fuel source, unlike other alternative on, uh, energy sources such as uh, solar or wind, which have to be first uh, converted in order to be used. And also, hydrogen has a very high energy content. It's almost three times that of gasoline. Gasoline only has 44 megajoules per kilogram, and hydrogen has 120. As you see right here, these are, uh, as of 2010, where the oil reserves in the world were at, are at. Uh, if you see, there are actually none in Cuba or around Cuba, so all the uh, oil that is used in the island has to be brought in from foreign nations. And even though maybe right now they don't have to pay for it, the transportation of the oil is very expensive, and there's also a lot of carbon uh, dioxide and other gases emitted through uh, the transportation of it. So now brings the question, why Cuba? Cuba's power infrastructure is deteriorating and is in need of significant upgrades. Uh, they need to break dependency from foreign nations as well as come up with an alternative source of energy. And what better alternative source of energy than an available source of energy? Cuba is a subtropical climate. It is cooled by the trade winds as well as having an abundant amount of water. It also, its land is 50% arable, so sugarcane is a very good available resource to consider. Um, sugarcane bagasse is the actual waste left after the sugarcane production. It accounts for 25% of the sugarcane mass, so it's a very high volume that's left after the whole production in the island is done. Um, there are uses for the bagasse. It's used for, uh, to create pulp and paper, fiber boards. It's also used in the hydrology system. And uh, it's mainly actually used to combust for energy as it can power the, uh, the, uh, pro the uh, sugarcane processing. Uh, one of the biggest problems that they have from it is that there's a lot of carbon dioxide emitted from that combustion. And there's also energy loss because the energy content from its combustion, it's only 7.3 megajoules per kilogram. And as I mentioned earlier, hydrogen has 120 megajoules per kilogram. Also, bagasse is very important because it is very rich in hemicellulose, which is a, a type of sugar, and it's very convenient to, uh, for, for the extraction of hydrogen. Um, here is the installed power capacity of, for Cuba in 2010. As we can see here, the majority comes from thermoelectric plants, uh, making up 61% of the total installed capacity. 31% comes from these small generators, also referred to as batteries. And 8% comes from natural gas, which is going to increase in the future. And um, less than 1% comes from biomass and wind farming. Uh, of all this, 35% is lost due to its deteriorating infrastructure. Here is a graph displaying the sugarcane production from 1955 to 2002. It's no secret that Cuba is well at, it, it can produce sugar really well, but we want to refer to recent times. So if we look at 1990, which I'll refer to later on in this presentation, they got a 1.8 million ton production yield of sugarcane. Here is a GIS map that we have developed of the sugar mills in the past decade, currently only 26 remain. However, what I like to emphasize with this whole picture right here is the distribution and how, unif how it's distributed uniformly throughout the island. This makes, if we do use sugarcane as a fuel, the transportation costs very minimal and very appealing. 
due to the need for a clean method of producing energy that utilizes the available resources in Cuba, we have looked at three different methods for the production of biohydrogen, including biophotolysis, microbial fermentation, and bioelectrochemical systems. The first thing we looked at is biophotolysis, bio meaning life, photolysis, the splitting of molecules via bombardment of photons. And um, well, photosynthesis, well, it basically utilizes photosynthesis in order to create hydrogen. Um, there are two types, there's direct and indirect, and uh, it was first acknowledged in 1939 that this happens in certain bacteria and algae, and uh, it wasn't fully understood until the late 1990s. Here is a uh, BIOS photobioreactor used to grow algae, but it's, this uh, design is purely aesthetic purposes, although it's pretty cool. Uh, direct biophotolysis is like the first thing that they saw and it's uh, basically certain algae and bacteria contain these enzymes that if you reduce them they will produce hydrogen. The problem with direct biophotolysis is that it produces oxygen and hydrogen at the same time which could be a little bit flammable and whatnot. But um, mostly it's the oxygen sensitivity of these certain enzymes and it doesn't allow it to yield as much hydrogen as it should. The solution to that is indirect biophotolysis and uh, basically they separate the two processes within the photosynthesis process which is very complicated and it's going to take like an hour if I went to go. <laughs> so basically the first stage, it uh, involves the light dependent reaction in photosynthesis and uh, it just goes through and you know it gets rid of the oxygen and creates these carbohydrates. And then in the second stage, which is the light independent reaction and under anaerobic conditions, which will make the yielding at least five times more than the direct biophotolysis, it uh, separates these carbohydrates and uh, the photons, and then it creates hydrogen gas. And a little bit of carbon dioxide, but it's so negligible compared to burning of fossil fuels. However, there are limitations to this technology currently scientists can only get yields of 0.36 millimoles per hour per liter of reactor. And um, right now, there's a lot of research being conducted on this to, pr uh, to improve productivity of hydrogen. And with nanotechnology, it's only a matter of time till this becomes implemented on a larger scale. As, as Melissa mentioned, one of the processes um, to yield hydrogen is microbial fermentation, which is the process in which bacteria produces the hydrogen through breaking down organic matter. Uh, the organic matter that would be used, it's also called a substrate, and in this case, the substrate that we would use is the bagasse. The hydrogen production depends greatly on the, uh, on the substrate used uh, because some of the compounds that are key for high hydrogen yields are actual sugars. And as I mentioned earlier, bagasse is made up of uh, hemicellulose, which is a sugar. So it's very uh, beneficial to uh, use the bagasse to extract the hydrogen from it. Uh, we looked at dark fermentation and light fermentation processes. And dark fermentation is more convenient because it doesn't rely on the availability of light. So it can occur continuously in a reactor, as we see here, where you have the bagasse coming in and just the, uh, the solids that the bacteria is are not able to break down to come out and then hydrogen on the other side. Um, here it's, uh, it's the chart and it has, these are different types of substrates that bacteria could uh, break down to produce hydrogen. And as you see here, glucose, which is a sugar and it's in the hemicellulose, it's at the very top. It, it's able to produce the highest amount of hydrogen in the shortest amount of time. Bioelectrochemical systems can be thought of, thought of as um, any electrochemical system where the bacteria serves as the catalyst for the oxidation of organic matter. There are two types of bioelectrochemical systems. There is the microbial fuel cell, where the reactions are spontaneous, therefore produces energy in the form of electricity, and it occurs under aerobic conditions. The microbial electrolysis cell derives from the mic microbial fuel cell, and in this case, the reactions are non-spontaneous, which means that it requires an external source of energy to produce hydrogen under anaerobic conditions. 
And this is an illustration of the process that occurs in a microbial fuel cell. First, the substrate is broken down by the bacteria into carbon dioxide, protons, and electrons. Here, uh, the cathode, in the cathode, oxygen is present, which will make the reaction spontaneous, and the electrons, protons, uh, travel to the cathode and react with oxygen to produce water, and during this process, energy is produced. The microbial electrolysis cell is the same idea. Substrate is broken down by the bacteria into carbon dioxide, protons, and electrons. In this case, which is different from the um, microbial fuel cell, no oxygen is present. So energy has to be supplied for the protons and electrons to travel to the cathode. And this is where they combine to produce hydrogen. And energy, again, has to be supplied. So carbon dioxide and hydrogen are then generated in different chambers of the cell. These are some experimental designs of the microbial electrolysis cell. The, oh, shoot, what happened? Okay, uh, this one here is the traditional design that was the first design of a microbial electrolysis cell to prove the concept where two bottles are connected by a tube and a membrane that facilitates the transfer of protons from the bioanode to the cathode. And these are continuous flow reactors that produce hydrogen continuously so it doesn't accumulate. And this is a single chambered MEC that does not include a membrane, thus uh, eliminates the loss of energy in the cell due to the presence of a membrane. And something I'd like to mention is that recent research has uh, tested the potential of using an MFC, because as I as I've already mentioned, the MFC produces energy, and the MFC has, needs a supply of energy. So what, what has been researched is the potential of using the MFC to power the MEC and produce hydrogen without no external source of energy. Now, we have reviewed three different processes of producing biohydrogen, biophotolysis, uh, dark fermentation, and the MEC. Uh, out of these three processes, dark fermentation proves to produce the most, the highest hydrogen yield. And uh, therefore, we propose an integrated system that combines dark fermentation and the MEC to produce even higher hydrogen yield. So we assume that sugarcane production in Cuba is approximately 50 tons per hectare per year. 25% of the sugar production results in waste, which is the sugarcane bagasse. The waste then undergoes hydrolysis, where 30 to 35% of this is broken into hemicellulose, and the rest is cellulose and lignin, which is solid matter that can go through the fermentation reactor, so we transfer it to the microbial electrolysis cell. And in the dark fermentation, as I, ex as I explained, it does produce the, mo the highest amount of hydrogen, except that it, it, there are end product pen products that bacteria can break down, but have the potential of producing more hydrogen. And so this is why we include the microbial electrolysis cell to extract more hydrogen and ma maximize the hydrogen yield. And in the end, the hydrogen produced from dark fermentation and the microbial electrolysis cell is collected and then transferred to one kilowatt fuel cell for electricity production. And just to recap, Again, 25% of all sugarcane production in Cuba is sugarcane by gas. It will undergo a hydrolysis process which is, where it's going to be broken down into hemicellulose and solid matter. That solid matter will go through the uh, microbial electrolysis cell while the hemicellulose goes through the dark, through the dark fermentation reactor. And any end products that result from fermentation is are then fed to the microbial electrolysis cell. The hydrogen produced from these two processes is collected for electricity production. 
and using the data and methods that we found in the literature, uh, we, we estimated the amount of hydrogen, the hydrogen production rate in, during fermentation and microbial electrolysis. Uh, using all this data, we calculate the volume of the reactants that would be needed for the design. For fermentation would be 3,360 liters for the microbial electrolysis cell, 2,090 liters. And for one kilowatt production of energy, a crop area of two acres would be required, and which is for one kilowatt production, it's a little bit less than a, a modest home would require, which is 1.3 kilowatts. Well, if we take Cuba and relate it to Florida, we can see that the uh, total generating capacity is way below the limits or the, which is really low. Uh, it should be like seven times more than it is. So right now, I understand I'm comparing it to Florida. It's, not, it's a developed country. It comes from a developed country and whatnot, and Cuba's not there yet. But we want to strive for getting as much energy as we can for the people. Um, if we see, and we go back to 1990, when the maximum, the most recent maximum sugarcane production yield was about 8.4 million, by using the bagasse alone, we can increase the installed power capacity of Cuba by about 200 megawatts. And if we use all the sugar, the, sh the, sh the actual sugarcane, break it down and put it into the system, we can get four times as much than using just the bagasse. And this entail will turn the bio waste, which was less than 1%, and uh, multiple, basically just take the whole thing and multiply it by 15, you get 15% more energy out of the total installed power capacity. So in conclusion, biohydrogen has the great potential to power the energy, energy needs of the island. It supplies fuel that does not have to be converted, uh, and it has a very high energy content. It's clean, it's renewable, and most importantly, it uses available resources that are already on the island, so it breaks dependency from foreign nations. Uh, combined systems, such as, the, such as the one we just mentioned, are beneficial because it increases the hydrogen yield, and uh, a system like the one we have in our design may be suitable for like a small distributed scale area. Thank you.